Have you ever heard of shockwave therapy for erectile dysfunction? Well, I'm Dr. Rena Malik, urologist and pelvic surgeon, and today I'm gonna talk all about what we know up until 2023 about shockwave therapy for erectile dysfunction. So there is new data emerging all the time about shockwave therapy. I made a prior video, and so this is an update on kind of where the data is today. To start off, we're gonna talk about what shockwaves are. Shockwaves are essentially sound waves that can carry energy, propagate through a medium, which is usually gel, and transfer to tissue. Now, shock waves have different kind of waves. The specific type of wave that you see in low intensity shock wave therapy, which is the one that is highly studied for erectile dysfunction, has a very characteristic waveform. It has a high peak pressure, which is achieved very rapidly, and then there's a subsequent pressure decay. And these particular shock waves have three parts to them. First, there is a short pulse followed by a rapid increase to maximum positive pressure, followed by a prolonged period of negative pressure. There are three types of shockwave generators, electrohydraulic, electromagnetic, and piezoelectric. And each of these uses a different method to generate the shockwaves. The electrohydraulic lithotripter has two electrodes where there's high voltage applied and there's a spark that's generated in between them. This causes a high amplitude wave that's in a spherical shape that's then focused by a reflector. On the other hand, electromagnetic waves use a high voltage electric pulse that causes this metal membrane to move away from a coil. This causes the pulse itself. And then the shock wave is focused by an acoustic lens or reflector. And lastly, the piezoelectric lithotripter uses special crystals that are shaped like a sphere that rapidly expand when you apply an electrical pulse. This then creates a pressure wave and the spherical shape of the crystals then causes the focused shock wave. So a lot of you ask me what are the names of these lithotripters and how do I know that the one that the person who's discussing shockwave with me is actually the right one. There are three electromagnetic machines available. One is called Duolith SD1 made by Stores Medical. Another one is called Aries made by Dornier MedTech. And the last one is called Renova made by the Durex system. For piezoelectric, there's only one option. It's the Piezo Wave 2. Well, you may have heard of some other companies, some other brands, some other machines that people are using. And what exactly are these? Well, a lot of them use radial shock waves. So how do radio shock waves differ from these focused shock waves that you're getting from low intensity shock wave therapy? The radial shock waves are actually pressure waves that have maximum pressures that are 100 times lower as well as pulse durations that are 100 times longer, which means that they have a shorter and longer pulse wave rather than a very focused and more intense shock wave. Therefore, they tend to penetrate the tissue at a much shallower depth of penetration which is usually about less than three centimeters compared to the low intensity shockwave therapy, which is penetrating about 10 to 12 centimeters. Because of these different types of shockwaves, radial shockwave therapy is classified as an FDA class one device, meaning that it does not require any medical supervision. However, the low intensity shockwave therapy is a class two medical device, and this actually requires supervision by a medical professional. And because of this, radial shockwaves are very commonly used because there's no requirement for medical supervision. Also, there's been very little peer-reviewed published literature on the efficacy of radial shockwaves. There are some small studies that say they work effectively. However, the majority of the data that we're looking at is in this low intensity shockwave space. I would encourage you, if you are looking to get shockwave treatment, to look for one of those machines that I mentioned earlier. So how do shockwaves work? Well, they create damage in one of two ways. The first way is directly. They create mechanical stress on the tissues because of that high high intensity shock, and two, indirectly, because they create a sort of turbulent flow in the blood vessels. This turbulent flow causes the body to react and respond to it like there's some trauma going on. This causes the body to increase the amount of growth factors, specifically VEGF, or vascular endothelial growth factor, which causes more blood vessels to be grown, a term called angiogenesis. It also causes recruitment of what we call stem cells or other early types of cells, which which then differentiate to create more blood vessels and repair damaged tissues that cause erectile dysfunction. It may also increase the production of nitric oxide in those tissues. And if you're new here, nitric oxide is the ignition for erections. If you don't have sufficient nitric oxide, you can't have an erection. There's also some animal studies that show it may play a role in nerve regeneration because it clears up some debris and scarring in the nerves and also recruits cells like Schwann cells, which are important in nerve 
of regrowth. So what do we know about shockwave therapy? Well, we know that there have been several randomized controlled trials, meaning that they had patients have shockwave therapy and another group not have shockwave therapy, and then they compared their outcomes. They've done it with no treatment versus a sham treatment, meaning they got something that sounded like a shockwave, but it really wasn't a shockwave. And they've also done meta-analyses and systematic reviews looking at the outcomes of all of these studies together. And when reviewing all of the literature on shockwave therapy, we found that men who have vasculogenic ED, meaning having erectile dysfunction because they have poor blood flow to the penis, like high blood pressure from smoking, other things like that, particularly those who are still responsive to medical treatment, meaning they still get an erection when taking something like sildenafil or tadalafil or brand name Cialis or Viagra, and they're still able to get an erection with medication. However, also in patients who have moderate erectile dysfunction, it seems to be appropriate, meaning they may have just recently stopped responding to oral medication, or they still occasionally respond to oral medications. So when we look at the data, when you compare shockwave to sham therapy, we found pretty much solid evidence that it does improve erectile function based on the erectile hardness score, which is a four point score, which people can use to kind of explain how hard their erection gets. Zero meaning they get no erection at all, and four meaning that they're completely firm and rigid. And they've even looked at something called the peak systolic velocity on ultrasound of the penis. What that means is that the speed of the blood flowing through the arteries to the penis increases after shockwave therapy. The other important thing is that in these studies, they've shown no obvious side effects associated with treatment. So when I last made a video about shockwave therapy, I told you guys that we had one year data, meaning that shockwave after one year showed that about 50% of people with mild to moderate erectile dysfunction had sustained improvements in erectile function at that time point. So now we have some small numbers of patients at two years and five years. In this study, they followed about 156 patients who had erectile dysfunction. Of those patients in the initial study at one month, they saw 64% have success, meaning that they achieved a clinically meaningful difference in their erectile function after receiving shockwave therapy. However, at two years postoperatively, of those remaining 64%, only 53% continued to have an improvement in erectile function. That's only 34% of the entire cohort. Interestingly, when they broke these patients down and they took out the patients who had diabetes and severe erectile dysfunction, 0% of those saw any improvement at two years. However, when they took out those patients, 76% of the remaining patients did have a successful outcome at two years. Another study at five years only followed up about 30 patients. Over those five years, they found that erectile function continued to deteriorate, but it tended to plateau at about 40%, meaning that 40% of patients had some clinical efficacy at 48 to 60 months after completion of the shockwave therapy. The other important thing was that there was no penile pain or deformity in these patients at five years, meaning that it is safe. Also, there's been a few small studies looking at shockwave therapy for patients who've had nerve injuries, specifically during radical prostatectomy for prostate cancer or radical cystectomy for bladder cancer. And the numbers of patients have ranged anywhere from 19 to 128 patients. And in many of these studies, they've seen some improvements. However, it's not met the definition for clinically significant, meaning you see a little bit of improvement, but it may not mean that much to you as a patient. And so the thought is that in these patients, shockwave therapy may be beneficial as an adjunctive treatment, meaning you can take it with medication or with other treatments to obtain better erectile function. So taking all this together, shockwave therapy seems to be most beneficial for patients who have mild to moderate erectile dysfunction, ideally not diabetic. It may be best for patients who want to optimize their response to medications or for those who've recently lost response to medication and need something additional to help with erectile function. And again, I think the big important take home from all this is that there has been no significant short or long-term side effects associated with the treatment. So why are people not recommending this as a treatment? Why is insurance not covering it? Well, at this point in time, very few associations around the country and around the world actually advocate for the use of shockwave therapy. For example, in meta-analyses of these studies, when you look at a number of these studies, you can find that the duration of treatment and the number of shocks per session and the machines used are very, very different. For example, when looking at 14 studies, they found that shocks 
shocks per session ranged between 1,500 shocks to 5,000 shocks, and that the length of treatment varied anywhere from six weeks to nine weeks. So it's hard to compare the results of these studies to each other. Also, there has been no significant long-term data, and we still don't know, is there a value in adding a maintenance? Maybe after a year, should you get another round of shockwave therapy, and how long should that be? Does it need to be another six weeks? Does it need to be three weeks? Does it need to be a week? We don't know. Another issue is that many of these studies were not powered appropriately, meaning that in order to see a difference from placebo or from a sham trial, you will expect that placebo effects are high in that arm. Just like we've talked about before on this channel, placebo effect is very powerful. In most erectile dysfunction trials, placebo effects are about 25%. So you need to power a study appropriately so you can accommodate for that placebo effect and say, okay, I know that placebo effect is going to be this much. I also know that I need to get this significant change between the placebo group and the clinical trial group to see that there's an actual difference and that that difference is meaningful. That's not just statistics. And so if the studies are not powered appropriately, you have to take those studies results with a grain of salt. And lastly, a lot of the studies have included multiple patient populations or have not focused in on the specific degree of severity of the erectile dysfunction to identify which patient populations this is going to be best for. So where does this treatment actually fit in? Is it in patients who are just starting to get erectile dysfunction? Is it in patients who have failed medical therapy? Who is it best for? And where are we going to put it in in the guidelines? So the Sexual Medicine Society of North America has created a position statement about these treatments. And they say, quote, the emergence of restorative therapies such as low-intensity shockwave therapy, stem cell therapies, and platelet-rich plasma therapy represents a new frontier of investigative therapies for erectile dysfunction. At the moment, however, the cumulative body of clinical trials for restorative therapies is largely incomplete, and many questions remain unanswered. The society, however, recognizes the need for adequately powered, multi-center, randomized, sham placebo-controlled trials in well-characterized patient populations to ensure that efficacy and safety are demonstrated for any novel ED therapy. The society agrees with the regulatory agency pathway of approval, including safety and efficacy studies, to achieve goals in diverse patient populations. Without FDA approval, the use of any novel therapy is considered off-label. To date, there is an absence of robust clinical trial data supporting restorative therapies efficacy in humans. Although relative safety has been established for stem cell therapy and low-intensity shockwave therapy, furthermore, the precise treatment parameters for low-intensity shockwave therapy, such as energy settings, dosing, frequency of use, and duration of therapy, among others, remains to be fully elucidated. So bottom line, I think that shockwave therapy is really exciting and has a place in the treatment for erectile dysfunction. However, because it's not yet covered by insurance, it can be very financially costly. And if you don't do your research, you may end up spending a lot of money and you may not benefit from the therapy. So it's important to know if you're going to investigate into shockwave therapy that you know which type of generator is being used. And if you are a candidate for this treatment, do you have mild to moderate vasculogenic erectile dysfunction? Because if you don't, at this point, we don't know if it's going to help you. Of course, many studies are underway and hopefully we will have answers soon. As always, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please share this channel with your friends and as always, remember to take care of yourself because you're worth it.